This video will look at instanced drawing. You'll be very happy to hear that for such a powerful feature, there isn't that much to learn here. It's simple to understand, and it's very easy to start using. So what is instance drawing? Well, here's a mesh that we want to use. We want to render it several times with only one draw call. Each one we want in a different location with a, a different size or a different orientation and a different texture. So that's, that's one mesh, one set of transforms, and one draw call, but several instances. And that's what instance drawing allows us to do. Is it worth learning? Well, is water wet? Do bears poop in the wood? Are rhetorical questions stupid? Y yes, in my opinion, it absolutely is worth learning because it's not some obscure optimization tool or niche technique. It's an alternative way of drawing things that make things simpler to think about and easier to code. It's a way to make your life as a programmer a little bit nicer. Just take a look. I'll go into the syntax in a minute, but here's the only new commands that you need to learn. It's basically just two or three functions. The rest of it is just rethinking your data a bit and splitting it into the parts that change and the parts that don't. So let's try this out. As always, we're going as simple as we possibly can. And as we go through this, I want you to keep in the back of your mind that although we're going to be dealing with just triangles right now, and only two of them, your mesh could be much more detailed, with hundreds or even thousands of vertices, and you could be drawing that mesh hundreds or even thousands of times. This could be for a particle system, or it could be for a, a matching tile game, or it could be a bullet storm, or a zerg rush. It's, it's a technique that's designed specifically to scale. So. Let's get going. As always, we start off with our shaders. They take in position, offset, scale, and color information. You can see our data has a lot of duplication. Our, our two triangles both have the exact same shape, so that's repeated twice. And each triangle has its own 2D offset, size, and color, and that's repeated three times, once for every vertex. In this case, we've combined the data of two triangles in the same vertex array buffer. This technique of putting separate meshes in the same buffer is called batching. And if you want to draw a bunch of unrelated meshes in a single draw call, this is almost always your best and fastest option. But in this case, our mesh data is identical. So this duplication is completely unnecessary. So let's break things down a bit. Now we have a single copy of our triangle's x and y position data in its own model array, and we have a single copy of each transform, the offset, scale, and color data, in its own transform array, nice and clean, no more duplication. So now let's do two draw calls to render this data. First, we can create a regular vertex buffer for our model data. That's as simple as it gets. Now, let's set our transform values by hand, using generic attribute values. Okay, there's one triangle. Actually, since our transform data is in its own array now, why don't we just loop through that and set the information that way? Okay, that, that was easy, no duplication, and our transform data is all nicely organized. But two draw calls? And what if it was 200? So yeah, this technique definitely has its appeal, but it scales pretty horribly. Okay, time for instance drawing. First of all, we have to put our transform data into its own buffer. and we need to describe the data in that buffer for WebGL. And we do that the same way we always do. We call vertex attrib pointer for each of our three attributes, offset, scale, and color. And enable them. 
We're missing something critical here, but let's just forge ahead anyway. Instead of calling draw arrays, let's call it draw arrays instance now. Its arguments are basically exactly the same as draw arrays. We're drawing triangles. We're starting from the beginning of the buffer, so zero. And there's just three vertices in our model, so that's three. And the new argument at the end is the number of instances we want to draw. Let's just try drawing one. And we get an error. Now, this is completely expected. Draw arrays instance isn't magical, and WebGL isn't psychic. It has no way to tell which of our buffers represents model data and which represents transform data. We can tell by the variable names we've chosen, but WebGL can't, so we need some way to tell it that this attribute belongs to the model and that attribute belongs to the transform. And we do that with vertex attrib divisor. It basically works the same as enable vertex attrib array, except for its second argument, divisor. And now it works. We have our red triangle back. And if we try to render two triangles, we get our blue one back too. Okay, let's look at our syntax now. We already know how to use draw arrays. It looks like this. The first argument is the primitive type, so triangles or triangle strip. The second is for how many bytes in our model buffers to skip over before drawing our array. And the third is the number of vertices to draw. Draw arrays instanced has the exact same arguments, which do the exact same thing. What's different now is that final argument. While the first three arguments are for just describing the model, this last one is for just describing the transforms. If it's 1, it'll try to draw one instance. If it's 100, it'll try to draw 100 instances. And I say try because if there's not enough data in the transform buffer, this function will throw an exception. You'll not be surprised then that draw elements instance is basically exactly the same as draw elements, except that its last argument is for the number of instances to draw, just like our last function. Pretty simple. And last, we have vertex attrib divisor. As we just saw, this marks an attribute as being for our instances, not for our model. The first argument identifies which attribute this is for, so this is the attribute location. And the second argument is for the divisor. The concept of the divisor is pretty simple. If the value is 1, then WebGL will use each line of our transform data for each instance one line for one instance. If this value is 100, then WebGL will reuse each line in our transform data. The first line will be used for the first 100 instances, the second line will be used for the next 100 instances, the third will be used for the third 100 instances, and, and so on. Now, you may be wondering why you'd ever want this feature. Wouldn't the first divisor instance just get covered up by everyone after it? Well, theoretically it could, but pretty much always at least one of your attribute divisors will be one. That will typically be a position offset or a transform matrix, something that will move the instance and make it visually separate from all the others. But after that, you're free to mix and match however you want, and this will depend completely on what you're trying to do. Say, for example, you have a hundred instances, but only two textures, or five colors, you could either write this value over and over in your transform buffer data, or you could just use a divisor to distribute them to your instances automatically. It depends on whether you need granular control or not. But setting this value to 1 all the time is not unusual at all. Right. At the top of this video, I showed you these space fighters, and I was able to reskin them by changing a single number using instance drawing. Let's go over how that works by adding it to our simple application. First off, we need a texture array. I covered this in my last video, and I highly recommend that you watch that if you haven't already. Here's my image. It's a single image that has two 256 by 256 textures stacked vertically. I can use text image 3 d to load these into a texture array so that the top image goes at a depth of 0, and the second goes at a depth of 1. Let's load that image. And add it to a texture array now.
We've hard-coded the depth value here, but we really want this to come in as its own attribute. Fragment shaders don't get attributes, so it will have to come in here as a varying. and sent into the vertex shader as an attribute. Oops, <laughs> wrong data type. Okay, that works. Now, normally you'd expect this depth value to be part of our UV coordinate, uh, technically our UVW coordinate, which right now seems to be part of our model. But there's nowhere in WebGL that says that all VEC3 components have to come in together. So we can add our depth data as its own float attribute. Our stride is longer now. And our new depth attribute location is 5. So we can add new calls to vertex attrib pointer, vertex attrib divisor, and enable vertex attrib array. And it works. Now we can select a different texture for each instance using a single depth value. And this will always work as long as your UV coordinates don't change from instance to instance or texture to texture. And the more that you work with instanced arrays, the more things like this you'll discover. So I, I really can't recommend this enough. It's powerful, it's intuitive, and it's incredibly simple. Except, well, okay, so there is this one problem. And actually, it has nothing to do with instance drawing. It has to do with WebGL and the way it does attributes. In this video, I used offset and scale operations. This is okay. It's not ideal, but it's okay. But a real application probably would be using a single transform matrix to do the same thing. This means adding a 4x4 four four matrix to your transform data, right? Just like you'd add a VEC2 for UVs or a VEC3 for colors. For data, this is super easy. If you can set a VEC3, you can set a MAT4. It's more bytes, but it's the same operation. But for setting up your attributes, yeesh, it's super not pretty, but it's not that bad. And it's really, really worth learning. First, because it allows you to use matrices in your transform data. It allows you to move and scale and rotate your instance models in 3D space super easily. But it also teaches us something about how WebGL works internally, and this will come in handy when we look at uniform buffers a little later. But my next video will be just on matrix attributes. It won't be very long, but I promise you it'll be worth learning.